thanks to Ted's uh, dogged persistence here, um, we have um, a couple now of, of interesting relationships that we've established between these different kinds of networks. And this latest one, which you can see on his screen uh, as Effect 28, um, shows that uh, close friendships uh, are more likely to lead to um, uh, what I'll just call tr a trust relationship, just for the sake of, um, uh, you know, brevity. Uh, although how we want to interpret that, of course, I think is still a little bit up in the air. So, so don't reify that terminology, if you wouldn't mind. Um, but it pretty clearly shows that if you um, are somebody's close friend, you're more likely to be uh, willing to trust them with, a, you know, a loan of $100 or more. Um, and that's the first, as far as I know, that is the first um, sort of micro dyadic level finding we've had from stochastic actor modeling showing how um, the loan relationship um, might be formed. Uh, we have results from other analyses and papers that we've done that show how the, the loan relationship seems to be a, a key element of um, preventing early house dropout and um, quicker relapse. So it's a protective factor, basically. And so one of the big questions has been for us, okay, what are the things that get somebody into the loan network and makes them trust it? And um, although it may seem obvious that a, you know, a close friendship um, would, be, uh, would be such a thing, it's, it's, only, it's only obvious in retrospect, okay? Um, I mean, yeah, it, it would, seem logical that close friends should trust each other in that way. But you might think that other rather less close factors would have an equal or greater effect, you know, and which could have to do with house norms and it could have to do with, you know, how the other person is perceived, even though you don't necessarily know them all that well. So kind of their other embedding, you know, in the, in the network. And by the way, some of those things could still be true. So I'm not saying they aren't. But finding that um, indeed some, you know, people, the important thing about this is that it's, it's a dynamic statement. It says that if you are close friends, then you will develop a um, relationship with another person. You are more likely later on to then say that you will trust them with a fairly significant loan. Um, so if we're just a correlation, it wouldn't be such a big deal. But the fact that it's, you know, separated in time and therefore more, more plausibly causal is a big deal and very John, interesting. So could you explain, John, kind of how those two entities, close friendship and loan, are sort of, are they both changing over the different waves? Or mm -hmm. is one basically the dependent and the other independent or is it more endogenous? In, well, uh, what this effect 28 there shows is that um, the close friend network um, potentiates, uh, leads to relationships in the loan network of trusting the other person, okay? By trusting, we mean loan, be willing to loan them $100 or more. Um, we have yet to look at the converse, which is, um, does a, a relationship in the loan network tend to, um, form or maybe help maintain a relationship in the close friend network. And that was one of the things, Ted, that I think you were going to look at. Um, I don't know if Almost you done, as you can see. Oh, look at it. Okay. Yeah, a little, so. Little bit gone. It's only, it's only got another um, probably 15 minutes to run. So, you know, if we can waste enough time here, we might actually see the results. Right. Let's talk about our dogs. And I, I, one important thing to mention is that yeah. this was not significant for friend net. It was yeah, only thank significant you. for a close friend. Thank you. And, and that actually surprised me because you might remember that the, um, we have a quasi-significant, um, in fact, you can see it down there, the effect 37 in your uh, model on the screen there, um, shows the um, average alter of, well, hmm, okay, so this model really, yeah, 
you, you have a non-significant and actually negative average alter effect from CF net. By the way, we should probably take that effect out of there. We, um, I, in the other model, I did. Oh, fine. Okay, great. Um, but, um, and, and it's probably um, uh, mucking up a little bit the uh, average alter relationship for F net, but consistently in other models where we just had the F net uh, average alter effect, it was showing a um, marginally significant effect, meaning that um, if you affiliate, you know, if you are friendly in the way we define the friend network uh, with others whose recovery factors are higher, um, then um, you will at, tend to improve your own recovery factor. So basically, affiliating with, with others who are more recovered helps you, which figures. But the interesting thing is that it's not true in the close friendship network very clearly here when you put the two together. Um, but it does still seem to, you know, be holding water in the friend network. Um, and that that's interesting. You know, I, you might have thought that if a close friend relationship was necessary to, you know, make you trust somebody, that something like those same close friend dynamics would be involved in the influence factor from recovery, but it's not true. Um, and, and this raises several other interesting questions. Um, <clears throat> one of which might be that um, what we're looking at here is less a dyadic effect than it is a house level effect. And what we're really seeing here is not so much the effect of you choosing a particular other person as a friend who has a higher recovery factor, but what's the average level of recovery factor that's available to you in the house you happen to be in, in terms of choosing friends. See what I mean? And those are slightly different, but importantly different uh, dynamics because, you know, one is kind of under your control if you're a house resident and the other one isn't. I mean, once you're there, you're there. And you're just, you, you have to cope with the environment the way it is. Um, and so this is a place where I want to get Nate involved in the conversation because he and I have been talking about some ways that we might be able to try to um, kind of tease out these, uh, these two distinct effects, you know, the dyadic attractiveness, let's say, attractiveness, let's say, of somebody with a higher recovery factor versus the network constraint of being in a house where a lot of people have a lot of recovery versus in a house where they don't. Okay. So I think that's one of the really interesting questions that we want to pursue here. Um, uh, another one is um, if indeed, I, I think we're still, we still have to worry about what is it that makes people light that is to say, is there, is there a way that we can, and I have some skepticism as to whether we can do this with our data because of the problem that we have with the fact that a person is likely to be judged as liked or not liked pretty quickly once they arrive in the house. And we don't, as we know, have data for most people right after they arrive. We have it some period later, we're probably the ship has sailed already, so to speak. Um, but for close friends, close friends probably take longer to develop. And I think we have a fighting chance of understanding better some of the um, factors that might uh, cause people to be close friends. For example, I don't think that we have tried yet, or have we? Okay, help me out with this. Have we looked to see whether time in residence or recovery factor similarity tend to predict close friendship formation? As far as I haven't looked at that yet, but I can. I, yeah. I know what you're saying. I just yeah. haven't yeah. yet. Right, right. I, I just couldn't remember. Um, I know that it's kind of been on our minds and stuff like that. So I'd say that would be an important thing to look at next. Can you repeat that so I can write it down? You said time and residence. Of course. Um, yeah, the in res L. Yeah. Similarity. Okay, and sin. Uh, and also RF similarity. R F. And you want to see whether those have an effect on, particularly on um, CF net relationships. So CF net will be your dependent yep. variable there. And, you know, um, that covariate similarity, um, sim X yep. effect will be the other one. Got it. And well, the other model's done running too. Oh, let's take a look. Okay. 
this is as much as a surprise to everyone as it is to me. But here we go. You want me to scroll down to the part where? Yeah. The look. Okay. Bad, the not bad. Convergence not is bad. fine. Convergence is okay. Wait. Let's see. Okay. There Stop. she is. I'm right there, buddy. Okay. Uh, Well, we still have that nice strong CF net effect. Um, and what was the other one that we added here? The CF oh. net loan. Oh, oh, right. Oh, <gasps> look at that. It's reciprocal. Look at look this at one, look right? at twenty one. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> cool. So they reinforce each other. Cool. Wow. So, so we have twenty one and twenty eight, right? Uh huh. Okay. Damn. Yeah, I flipped it. Well, Lenny, you know, we have a paper right there if you want to write it. Um, we don't have the whole story yet, but the, the story would be basically um, something, it would go something like this. We know that being the loan network is really important to long-term outcomes from our previous results. So how does the loan network interact with um, you know, other elements of social cohesiveness in the house. And it turns out that um, being a close friend, if, if you find somebody you can be a close friend with, that will get you into the loan network. But moreover, once you're in it, it will tend to um, uh, help maintain those close friend relationships, okay? So basically the effect is going in both directions. And that suggests there's something quite important about a close friendship. And that really dovetails well with the Ed story from his paper a few years back about uh, having a close friend in the house. So, so, so there's, John, your pa there's your paper and you know, so, 20 words or less. So John, could you maybe just kind of elaborate a little bit for, for the group as to kind of, you know, from theoretical point of view, you know, how does this, you know, like fit together? And does it kind of, re does it basically support other researchers who have been looking at some of these things? Is there some commonalities? Is there some kind of underlying theoretical net to, to the stuff that we're emerging into, just from a more of a sociological point of view? Sure, um, well, I'll, I can riff on that, but, you know, understand that I'm really, maybe just setting forth some some discussion points here okay and I'm sure you guys would all have some ideas about this too um, but I'll just say and, and I'm gonna try not to monopolize the conversation here because I'd like other people to um, to talk about this as well because I'm only looking at this from my point of view and you know we're all smarter together than any one of us um, but it seems to me that you could look at this uh, as a case of um, the fact that uh, there is a positive feedback loop between um, depending on somebody or being willing to depend on somebody, for example, for financial support and the closeness of the relationship. So it's a basically an exchange theoretic kind of an argument. You know, you find out that, that you can uh, rely on somebody for certain kinds of help. That makes you trust them more and it makes you feel closer to them. Um, and, um, but the converse is true too. I mean, if you like them, you get along well with them. Um, for other reasons, it may be that um, that will make you more likely to take a chance on, for example, helping them financially if they need it. Okay, so the idea is that you have this interde interdependence between, um, you know, the, the sentiment, the emotional loading on a relationship, if you will, and um, the uh, um, instrumental viability of it. By instrumental, I mean it's, it's it, you know, practical, everyday, um, you know, need for resources, social capital. Kind of kind of element, and so it sort of speaks to the way that 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 social capital 
can be used as a way to support, develop, and reinforce relationships from a theoretical point of view. And it really fits beautifully well with the kinds of um, um, you know, theoretical uh, ideas we've been tossing around about this stuff uh, really ever since the project started, but particularly over the course of the last year or so. Um, so that would be my thought about this. Um, other people um, have some ideas about it? Yeah, John, I, I think that that makes sense. It, it certainly, um, it, is it possible that some people might say, well, that's so intuitive what really are you adding to what people would think of would occur just kind of naturally? You have a sense of like how you'd respond to that argument in, in terms of you know people developing trust and then willing to develop friendships. I mean, is, is there something that we could say is different from one, would, one might assume um, with, without having the data? Well, I mean, it's a little bit like saying, you know, your, your, theor your theoretical uh, uh, assumptions have been verified. So that, that means it was all obvious a priori. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not obvious until you've demonstrated it empirically. And how many ideas have we had in social sciences that sounded great, you know, until you actually went and took a look at them and you discovered it was something different? So I, I, don't, I don't really even consider that to be a, a significant issue. Um, the truth of the matter is, you know, although I'm not really, I'm not really an expert in, you know, the social capital literature per se. Um, I'm not even sure there is such a thing because it's sort of dragged in as a way of, of talking about um, things like, um, you know, relationships as a resource or access to resources or stuff like that. But it isn't as though that literature has this huge... Um, compendium of findings that show that it's true, particularly when it comes to individual level decision making about relationships, you know, and in a lot of cases, the studies conflate individual decision making with contextually constrained decision making, which, you know, is a problem we have here too, still, because we, as we know, these homes form a um, these sort of ecologically uh, unique environments. And it's hard to know for sure how much of that we're seeing here. Um, you know, in other words, people are making these choices not because they want to, or this is what they do in a completely, I don't know, wide open ecosystem, if you can imagine something like that. Um, but, but at least within the context of these houses, it does appear that these dyadic decisions um, conform with the ideas that we have of um, the formation and consequences of social capital. And, you know, that's a pretty big deal in terms of um, demonstrating how social capital arises and what its role is in these kinds of, of um, uh, of these, these kinds of social situations. I really don't think there's a lot of studies, if any, that I'm immediately aware of that have attempted to model this at the level of individuals making decisions in these contexts. Um, so it's a lot different to say, well, they must make these decisions, see what the data says, compared to actually showing a model which shows that yes, indeed, if you are here, you're more likely to become there, but also if you're there, you're more likely to become here. Okay, and that dynamic element again is a really, really important aspect of this. Um, there's so, hardly so, anything on that. So, John, is is when you say hardly anything, can you? I mean, in the other social network literature, can you think of anything else that's, I mean, even comparable that that could be a connecting point that other people have found? There probably is stuff in, in the literature on um, intra or maybe even inter-organizational networks that could be relevant here. 
like I know some people study, you know, business organizations and, you know, they use it as a way to figure out kind of effective team building and, you know, leadership and things of that nature, you know, where you have, um, where you're mostly dealing with what I would call instrumental relationships. You know, you've got a bunch of people working together to try to, I don't know, get a software product out of the door or something like that. So it's a little bit different contextually, but you can see there would be some relationship. Um, and I think that that might be a literature that would be worth maybe poking around in a little bit. Um, Good. Oh, that, that's helpful. I mean, again, other than that, you know, it's, it's hit or miss. So, so, so John, just to kind of step back, I mean, you know, clearly, um, you know, this last, you know, period of time has been incredibly helpful to think about how to do these analyses. Right. Um, and to, you know, record it so that people can go back and, and sort of think about that. So, so that's mm -hmm. been, um, really helpful. Do you have any kind of comments about this process that's been going on over the last uh, few weeks that uh, we've been having these meetings? A any thoughts on, on your part concerning kind of how, how, how it's been going? Oh, my, my thought are, it, well, I mean, I think it's self-evident that we've been very productive. Um, and it just demonstrates to me that, you know, these, these things are often better done in a team kind of a way than it is, you know, than they would be if, let's say, I was the only one doing it. I mean, you know, yeah, I'd probably get around to these things eventually, but, you know, we can devote, I mean, I run out of brain cells after a while, you know, it's, it's exhausting enough putting together these runs to make them work because it's very intricate and there's, you know, you make one mistake and the whole thing's wrong and blah, 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 blah. And so this has enabled me to take a step back and think a little bit more broadly about the whole, the whole process instead of being, you know, in so worn out by the nuts and bolts of it that I got, I got no neurons left to think, <laughs> which I mean, to be honest with you, Lenny, it's probably partly a function of age. I mean, it's the sort of thing that when I was younger, I, you know, I wouldn't, that wouldn't bother me so much, but now it does. And, and I find it liberating and, um, um, well, um, exciting really to be able to think about this stuff instead of just having to do it. Um, you know, I, I hope that, you know, Ted and the, and the other folks are able to kind of do both because, you know, you're, <laughs> like I say, you're, you're younger and better able to absorb stuff and, and you just have more energy. You know? Um, so I think it's, I think it's been a great uh, team effort and, and I'm really grateful to you and, and, and Ted and everybody else who's been involved in this process. Um, so for John, what we've been able to accomplish. So John, initially our idea was to bring you in for doing a workshop really right. would have been maybe two or three days right. of, uh, intensives. So, so what this has been really is, um, you know, spread out over maybe a month, but I think it's, it's really given us a chance to kind of do what would have happened had you come in again, you know, we couldn't have you come in because of COVID-19, but I think this served in part that function of what we were hoping for. It, it might have even been better because, you know, the problem is that you can't, like if we were doing models where you could run a model and you get the results five minutes later, we could cover a lot of ground in three days, but there's only so many models that you can run, you know, in a three day period, let's say when each one of them takes an hour or two. Uh, and so it, and, and you know how, well, okay, right. I mean, if you're learning, like a musical instrument or a language or something like that, there's no such thing as cramming, right? I mean, you're not going to learn any faster if you practice eight hours a day for three days than if you practice one hour a day for, you know, whatever it would be, three weeks. Um, in fact, the latter is better because you allow your brain some time to absorb the material. And so I'd like to think that that's kind of what's going on here and that, that you know, you guys, as time goes along and you, see how this stuff comes out and you ask me questions and we discuss it, that it all just starts to become clearer what the game is and how this stuff works and how to think about it. And um, yeah. 
and <clears throat> what what I'm hoping for is, um, and I don't think we're quite there yet, but I can see it kind of coming. Is you know the next step will be when um, you guys are able to formulate hypotheses and see which effects you should use in the models in order to test them. Um, you know, right now that's still kind of more on me, but that's the kind of thing that you want to be thinking about is, you know, okay, so what does this mean? Big picture. How can we test that in a model like this? Now here would be a good example. Are there characteristics of um, individuals in these houses, uh, which other than, um, let's say a close friend, which might make them um, good candidates for loaning. If so, what we need to do is to see whether those characteristics of alter make them a better target for ego as somebody that you would trust. So that would be an alter, an alt X effect, right? When you get to the point where you can think like that, you know, where you've got, um, an idea and then you can take it all the way down to say, okay, that's a such and such a kind of an effect in these models. Um, I know how to do that. Then, then you've really got this thing by the throat. So, just And I think you're close. Yeah. So just in terms of kind of specifics, I know that um, you spent, Gabby, we still have you with us, don't we? Yeah. yeah, I'm still here. Good. So, Gabby, I, I know that John spent a little bit of time with you on Tuesday, with you know, with uh, um, and and I know that that he was able to untangle a couple things from kind of what you were trying to do. Um, I'm just kind of, and I know, yeah, I'm just kind of wondering, do you have any questions for John? concerning that run that you did or have, and, and if you do, this might be a good time to just get uh, some of John's thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Um, I definitely did have some questions because I was very excited to run this analysis and it looks like it was working, but it appears, I'm assuming that my laptop doesn't have the power to run the analysis. Um, so I just kind of wanted to shoot that idea by you because I tried running it. We're talking about the cores of a yeah. laptop and how much you can run at a time. I tried running just one and mm -hmm. my program kept on crashing. Like it would try and run for maybe 20, 30 minutes and then it wouldn't run. So I didn't know if there were potentially um, like more simplified models that I could try and run for this um, just to still practice running or what some potential solutions might be for this issue. Wait, t tell me what happened again that, that made you think that you don't have enough horsepower? Yeah, so I tried running the model using just one core. I can open it too, if you'd like. You could screen share, because I stopped. Okay, perfect. Let me just do this open. Okay. So it was, let me find the line again. So I tried changing this because this is what we're saying here it was originally seven. And oh, I see. Here's the problem. I know I can see what the problem is immediately. Okay. Um, you have use cluster equals T, but you don't have a cluster. You've only got one node. So you should put use cluster equals F. And then number nodes is irrelevant, I think. At that point? You, I think so, yeah. Um, we can check the help text on that if you want. Um, why don't we just do uh, question mark CN07 in the uh, console? So open up the console window, which is a, you know. Bottom two left. Two little tabs that you see That's below. Fine. Yeah, 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 there you go. And yeah. just uh, type at the, at the caret mark there, mm -hmm. type um, um, question mark CN07. A small s. Remember, it's uh, case sensitive. Thank you. Oh, seven. And then just enter. Mm hmm. And over in that lower right hand window, 
Oh, wait a minute. You must not have, um, uh, you must not have our Sienna test loaded right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so just um, put in library RC and a test. Where the care is? Yeah. Paren, RC and a test. And don't remember, don't forget to, yeah. Does it have yeah. to be in quotes or no? I don't think so. Okay. Enter? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Install yeah. packages is in quotes. I know, confusingly enough, right? Um, that's R for you, unfortunately. Okay, let's try that same question mark command again. By the way, you know, you can just um, uh, uh, up arrow to it. Oh, all okay. right. There you go. Smooth. All right, here we go. Okay, uh, let's scroll down to um, the uh, a little further to the arguments. Okay. All the right there. Yeah. So um, if you put use cluster equals F, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't say if it ignores number nodes or not, but I would just take number nodes out in that case, just say use cluster equals F or simply don't include a use cluster statement because the default is, um, I believe false. Okay. And then try it. In fact, okay. we can do that right now. All right, sure. Let's do that. Let's see. How do I minimize this one again? Just this. There we go. Yeah. Hey, John. The global environment. Oh, your your environment. Yeah, you have to. You have to, of course, do all the stuff you have to do, which is a lot of packages, a lot of environment, all of that. Or if you saved one, but, you can just uh, upload it in. Um. Oh goodness. Well. But if you didn't, then you just have to run it from the top. Sometimes I say. But I, but I guess, it should, don't you have a, um, well, here, why don't you lo load all the packages? Well, you did that. Okay, never mind. Okay. Yeah. Never hurts to do it again because this statement is actually only loading them if they're not already loaded. All right, now scroll down a little more. And um, are you, okay, you're, there you, you're loading your Gabby workspace uh, by running the chunk starting at line 24. So run that. Bam, bam. And your global environment fills nice. up with the workspace. Okay, now you're ready to go. Um, why don't you scroll down to the CN07 call again and run that. Okay. And let's see what happens. Yeah. All right. So the little window popped up. Right. Yeah. Now this all was true before because it didn't it didn't find this error right off the bat. It takes a few minutes. But by the way, just to answer your general question, if you run a model like this um, on a you know machine using only one core, obviously it's going to take you know a good deal longer. Mm -hmm. But it'll run. You know, I mean, it'll definitely run. Okay, so it was just the cluster. Yeah. Man, that we're thinking. Okay. Um, and then, in the case that I do get access to a computer that does have um, more processing power, mm -hmm. should I try and change the cluster effect back on? Oh hell yes! You okay. should use as many clusters as you've got. I mean, um, you'd be surprised. Well, there's there's a limit. Basically, you know the uh, uh, performance improves about as the square root of the number of clusters, right? So it kind of improves at a decreasing rate. Mm -hmm. So I found that about 12 or 15 cores is about, you know, pretty much as good as 20 or 25. I've tried this on, you know, Amazon Web Services instances and stuff like that, where, you know, they have these, um, I mean, you can basically crank up, you know, 100 core uh, virtual machines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a hundred isn't really a whole lot better than 15. It turns out, unfortunately, uh, mm -hmm. we did it were otherwise. Um, but yeah, if you have a, uh, uh, a machine with eight cores, I would recommend that you use seven. Okay. Yeah. If you had 16, I would probably try 15. 
So I think I have nine. Should I be using eight? Because I'm using seven. You have an i9? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's actually eight processors, despite the nine, okay. the number nine, which I, I, I could be wrong about that, but that's my recollection. But if you had I'll nine, look. which would be odd, by the way, because, you know, that's, after all, we're binary, aren't we? I mean, you know, mm. <laughs> it's two to the third. It's not nine. Okay, let's see here. Um, but, uh, yeah, it looks like you're going okay so far, Gabby. Yeah, I'm just hoping that it completes. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you'll know that you're going when the, the, the window with the feather, the feather window pops up and you have, um, it's got numbers in it. You know, once it gets numbers in it, then, um, then you're, you're cooking. It's not cooking yet. It's just, yeah. it's, it's in the, it's in the warming up phase. It's trying to think. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. It's a Friday and it's tired. <laughs> you know. Real. But yeah, hopefully you'll be okay. And if that doesn't work out, just shoot me an email, you know, sh show me what happened um, and I'll help you fix it. Okay. Yeah. This is all part of the process. By the way, I'm going through some of the same things on another analysis with uh, Mike, who's helping me with M plus, you know, I haven't used M plus in like eight years. Uh, and oh my God. It's so complicated, you know, and the syntax is impenetrable and, the models are endlessly complicated. And so, you know, you guys are all uh, uh, just going through the same thing that, um, you know, on different pieces of software. It never ends. Good. So maybe we can just check. Does anybody else have any Arsiana questions um, that they want to ask John today? Anything that they're working on? And, and certainly John's available to chat with other times too, but just so, so as long as we're all here. If, if not, um, you know, I can mention that um, I did have a conversation with Kathleen, who is, you know, um, under Paul Malloy, um, who runs the Oxford organization this morning. So, um, and uh, um, yeah, so sh she continues to be very interested in um, our work, um, thinks it's extremely valuable, appreciates um, our efforts. Um, she did give me some, I asked her specifically about how things are going with the organization um, with COVID-19 and she said extremely well um, that the people in the houses seem to be really supporting each other, um, providing help, um, you know, and it's, it's actually, uh, so um, she's been actually pleasantly surprised. Um, and they've actually started contracts with uh, two new states. So they'll be opening up more Oxford houses. So, um, so she was pretty wow. delighted. Um, the, uh, I, Myra asked her a little bit about the college houses, collegiate houses. Um, and um, it does seem like there's more than I thought. Um, there's a number of them, but I think the the key issue is, you know, what's going to happen with school, and are people going to be living at home, or living in the houses? Um, so this mm. is kind of a like a little bit of a transition time wow. for, for that group. Um, but I think uh, you know certainly as the COVID nineteen things start getting resolved as to you know what's going on she'll have more sense, but it, it does seem like uh, there's at least four houses. Um, and, uh, um, but, you know, the, the key question is um, where the kids are leave, living. Are they living in the house or they go back to their families? Um, and that's something they're, uh, they're working with. So good. Um, well, um, I think, uh, if we have gone over the issues, if, if uh, nobody has any other things to bring up today, if they do, feel free to um, let us know. If not, um, again, we just want to thank you, John, for giving us these uh, sessions over the last month. 
Um, and I think now, again, you know, we will continue to be able to use your expertise um, as we go forward. Um, well, I'm excited about uh, writing some papers, you know. I mean, I think we're really uh, getting pretty close to, to where we can do that. And, um, I mean, I would like to find out more about, you know, how some of these relationships are coming about. Um, you know, I, I think the, the story is yet kind of incomplete. Uh, but we, the thing is that we have evidence now for the core assumption that this whole project was founded on, okay? The idea that social relationships within the house have a lot to do with how people do. And, and we're starting to get some understanding of, of how, um, uh, how those social relationships are forming. Um, and I'm optimistic that we can find out some more. I mean, it's hard to, always hard to know how much more, right? Um, at the very least, I think we've got a great basis, if people are interested, for writing another grant proposal uh, where we could um, do a better job of designing the data collection to be able to address some of the mm -hmm. questions that we can't address or may not be able to address so well here. So, huh, here we go. And earlier, John, you mentioned that like uh, uh, Lenny and I doing this has taken some pressure off of you and let you do your thing. But like on the flip side too, I just wanted to tell you how appreciative I am of you actually taking the time to teach us these things because like, yeah, you got pressure off of you, but we also got to learn something really new and fascinating. And you know what I oh, mean? Yeah. Like once you learn something and then you've given it away, you got to keep it and we got to learn it. And then like, nobody can take this from us. I know how to do this for the rest of my life. And that's amazing. You know, I'm forever grateful. That's one of the things that I love about uh, being an academic, you know, well, about anything really you know if you learn how to do something it's yours forever um and um that's part of what i really enjoy about being an academic maybe the main thing hmm. so. and i think some of the cool things we could do if we wanted to take it deeper and i know i've heard megan express interest in it before about like loaning and like sex differences too like do women does this oh, still yes. matter for we have talked about that. We need to have, have you know, somebody here, um, Megan, maybe, who knows? Uh, <laughs> you out there, Megan? Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, well, the ball's a little bit in my court because I need to basically devise, I need to divide the networks up into male houses and female houses and, and structure it so that, that we can start running some, um, uh, some models on those two houses separately. And I think that would probably be the best way to go about doing it. Um, but if I can get that done, I've just been so darn busy, you know, with, with this and everything else, but that's right there, you know, on, you know, the back burner, but very close to the front burner. Mm -hmm. And that's another whole set of, you know, that's a month or two worth of analyses right there. The results of which I'm sure would be fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. yeah. So I think that's that's another thing we could be really excited about. And the same is true for, I mean, we can continue to look at uh, you know, ethnicity issues uh, and um, and other stuff. And, ah, uh, boy. Employment, I too, since we're talking about money, how does employment play with that, too? Like Absolutely. Would somebody loan to someone who's not employed and vice versa? That would be another interesting one to look at. You know, actually, since you mentioned that, Ted, that is another really important thing um, that should be used to investigate um, the formation of relationships of friendship and trust uh, is, you know, whether Alter is employed or not. Mm -hmm. Or it could just be, um, you might just even use their, um, their income. I'm not sure which would be the better indicator. Uh, but, you know, it would be a characteristic of, the idea would be that it would be a characteristic of alter that would make him or her more or less attractive as a um, loan partner, but maybe also even as a close friend. I don't know. Um, right. If it turned out to be a loan partner, by the way, wouldn't it be fascinating? Because we already know that not only does close friendship promote loan relationships, but the converse is true too. So if you're willing, if somebody, let's suppose it went like this, somebody gets a job, 
other people realize they're willing to loan the money, that makes them more likely to become close friends with that person. You know, which then reinforces the loan status and basically forms a kind of a um, cohesive um, positive feedback loop wherein people are hooked into a network which allows them to access resources when they need them. Both socio-emotional relationships, uh, re relationship related resources, but then also, you know, financial ones. So yeah. another great story right there. I mean, there's, that's a paper right there. And that ties directly into the paper where having at least one friend in an Oxford house betters your chances of long-term recovery. And it if we're looking at more specific ways to, exactly, it would explain it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Very nice. Okay. Lots to do. Lots of ideas. Okay, John. Well, once again, we thank you for all your help. over. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. It's a good team. And, yeah, thank you. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll Everybody's stay. rocking it. All right. We'll talk soon, eh? Okay. Mm. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Okay. Bye.